So tell me, do your thoughts sound a little something like this? What if I have a panic attack? What if I pass out? What if this isn't just anxiety? What if I lose all control? What if I can't get home quickly enough? What if I go crazy? My brain used to throw all of these what-if thoughts my way and then some on a daily basis. But nowadays, I live my life without the what-ifs, worries, and fears. And I know you may be thinking, yeah, right, Shannon, but this type of freedom is possible. And I want to show you how to get there without it being so hard or complicated because it truly isn't. So if you're like, yes, please show me how, I want you to join me for my live 90-minute masterclass on March 27th, where I'll be teaching you how to respond very simply and practically to your thoughts and feelings so that they stop showing up and causing so much chaos. And no, I won't be teaching you how to journal your thoughts or how to challenge them or how to meditate or breathe your way through them. Instead, I'll be teaching you very simple and practical approaches to your thoughts and feelings so that you can finally find freedom from them. So if you're ready to quiet your mind and get freedom from your anxious thoughts and the really uncomfortable feelings and experience lots more peace, simply head to the link in the show notes, sign up, and I'll see you on March 27th. And if you can't make it live, you'll still want to sign up so that you get access to the recording. And I promise the recording will be just as helpful as the live. Welcome to a Healthy Push podcast. I'm Shannon Jackson, former anxiety sufferer turned adventurer, mom, and anxiety recovery coach. I struggled with anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia for 15 years. And now I help people to push past the stuff that I used to struggle with. Each week, I'll be sharing real and honest conversations along with actionable and practical steps that you can take to help you push past your anxious thoughts, the symptoms, panic, and fears. Welcome. You're right where you're meant to be. All right, today I'm super excited because I have two ladies with me that I actually listen to their podcast. And before we hit record, I was like, okay, this feels so surreal. And I feel like I'm fangirling a little bit. Um, but I have Rachel and Stacy with me, and they're both therapists and relationship relationship experts who provide real tools for real couples. And they are the host of the Decoding Couples podcast. And just two super relatable, down to earth, funny, like helpful human beings. So, Stacy, Rachel, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here on the podcast. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so excited. So, I reached out to my community and basically they were like, okay, you're having relationship experts on. I really just want some of these questions answered. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got so many good questions. And so I'm so excited to dig in. And I just have to say, both of you, of course, I want you guys to go check out their podcast, the Decoding Couples podcast, because they share so much really good sound relationship advice. But because of both of your vulnerability and courage to share what you do on your podcast and to just speak how you speak all of it, you really take so much shame out of relationship issues, like having relationship issues, navigating it. like. And so I know this is going to be a really helpful conversation and sort of do the same right now for my community. So Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So of course, struggling with your mental health is incredibly hard, like in and of itself. And then trying to navigate your relationship, maybe maybe find a relationship, maybe be in a relationship, it's incredibly hard, especially when you're struggling with things like anxiety and panic. And I think a lot of people think, I can't be in a relationship when I'm struggling. Like, this just isn't going to work. Or my partner is going to want to leave me, like when Mm -hmm. they find out all this stuff. Or I don't want my partner to have to deal with me. Like, I think that they should just, you know, leave and not be with me and not have to, quote, deal with me. So let's start here and have a little conversation about all this because I think it's really helpful to just lay out like, can you be in a relationship when you're struggling with your mental health? Yes, you can absolutely be in a relationship without feeling 100% with your mental health. I feel like a while back there was like a 
like a quote going around that got traction about like, you can't be loved unless you're like fully loved yourself or, you know, it was something around that vein. I don't remember exactly what it was. And as much as I understand that like, sure, we want to be working on ourselves and making sure that we know our stuff and bringing awareness into relationships, this idea that like we have to be our best selves and have zero concerns or have a handle on anything in order to be loved or to feel safe or to even just have relationships where we can have corrective experiences relationally, regardless if they are our person, is necessary. Like we need that in order to heal and work through our mental health stuff. So yes, simple answer, yes, you can be in a relationship while struggling. Dang, I love it. And <laughs> it's like, and go ahead, Shannon. I, I love that you said that though, Stacey, that it's not only can you be in a relationship, but it's actually really helpful to be in a relationship. And I think we think, right, with a lot of things, like I have to put my life on hold while I work to heal myself. And mm-hmm. everything sort of has to stop in order for me to get better and then I can live. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. That's not helpful. <laughs> what yeah. were you going to say, Rachel? I would say give him the end though, Rachel. Give him the asterisk. Well, yeah. It's just so funny because I think that I'm always trying to think about how when we're on you know, our podcast or any podcast, like just how anyone else would listen to it. And it's like we always are speaking from our own attachment styles. And I'm just like, yeah. Mm. And you can co-regulate with someone. It's so important. I think Stacey's right. You don't need it's unrealistic, right? To be like completely healed or like, Fully I'm not, healed. I'm going to be whole. And you've got to also be, have an awareness of like where you do need to do your healing because I do watch a lot of people either swing, um, one way of like, I'm unlovable because I'm struggling and because of my mental health, which is like, isn't true. And, um, not having maybe like boundaries or awareness that, that might be, you know, a definitely a slippery slope in the relationship. And so being able to be open to your partner when they're like, hey, I need, you know, a break from A, B, and C because like, I'm not really sure how to help you, but I still love you. Or knowing like when your own boundaries are maybe just like need to exist or be a little stronger because your anxiety is really high or maybe you're not able to regulate yourself. So like everything Stace is saying is 100% spot on. And part of getting to a place where you don't feel like shameful about that you're struggling or having mental health is also just, you know, knowing where your own um, stuff is that you need to work on to make sure that you don't kind of fulfill that. What's that like fulfilling prophecy of like, well, I'm not lovable. See, because then they told me that they need a break. It's like, it's a balance. It's both. You do not need to be fully healed because none of us are. None Mm -hmm. of us are. And you've got to be aware and open to like your partner may need, you know, to have some space, may not be able to completely soothe you in the way that you want. So that was like my only asterisk because I could just see it in the DMs, people being like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh. Yeah. No, I'm so glad that you said that. I think that's really important. I know when my husband and I met, we, you know, I was struggling immensely with panic and agoraphobia and Mm. I couldn't regulate. And we would have, you know, full blown fights and arguments. And I would just feel so bad because I felt like a lot of it was because of all the shame that I was carrying about just struggling, just the fact that I was struggling so badly and I didn't want things to look the way that they did. But it was so incredibly helpful for me throughout my journey right to learn that, that that was a big part of why it kept popping up. And to let him in and like communicate how he could actually be helpful for me too was a big part of it. Yeah, because then you learn that you are separate, right, from Mm -hmm. how your symptoms are presenting. I think so often whatever we're struggling with, you feel like you're that thing, whether it's anxiety, depression, OCD, you feel the shame makes us feel like we are the behavior. But until Mm -hmm. we're able to, again, you don't have to be healed, but just to be open to this is what my partner needs in order to love me also while I'm struggling, that's where you also get the space to be like, oh, I can be struggling and I'm not unlovable. I can be struggling because this is what I'm dealing with, but that doesn't mean I'm bad or something's wrong with me. So like what you just said, Chan, is like so key because until you let them in and struggle with them, you're also not going to be able to realize like, oh yeah, I struggle and I'm still worth like all the good things. Yeah. 
Oh, so good. I think you, like you've touched on this already, but I think this is such an important one to ask because so many people struggling with anxiety disorders feel like they're a burden. Like what I'm struggling with is so hard and I feel like everyone has to deal with it. Like everyone has to deal with me being scared all the time, me being fearful, me not wanting to go places, not wanting to do things. So a lot of people ask that question of how do I not be seen as a burden to everyone around me, not just like the romantic relationships, but all relationships. This is so tricky. And I think you're right that everybody that struggles in that way, maybe, and maybe not even just with anxiety, with anything, like you don't want to flood your people. You don't want to burn them out. It's hard to take up space. Um, And there's a couple things. At the end of the day, we can't control if somebody finds us a burden, right? Mm. Like if it is too much for somebody, um, that doesn't mean that you are too much. That just means that maybe they don't have the skills or capacity or going through their own stuff that they can't show up in a certain way. And that doesn't have to mean anything about you. So I do think that there has to be just a general acceptance that like everybody is functioning on their own and what their boundaries are and what your needs are might not align. And then you have to reconsider what that relationship is or represents to you. It doesn't mean that that the friendship or the family dynamic or the partnership is over, um, we also don't want people burning out on us, right? And forcing themselves to need to continually show up and hear the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then it does create that outcome that we're afraid of. So I do think there has to be a general acceptance of Again, this is not what Rachel was saying earlier. Like, this isn't about me. This is separate from me of how somebody else can show up. But that in itself is so much work, right? Like, <laughs> being able to even separate that is is so much work. Um, yeah. Second thing is I think, like, you have to be – it's uncomfortable to let people support you. Like, I will yep. – personally, I am um, going through a – a transition period, like a rough, a rough patch. And I recently just had like some of my oldest friends come together to like do a girls weekend, like flew different places from across the country to show up for me. And I like didn't want to go. Like I was so uncomfortable because it does feel like this is a lot. Like this is a lot just for me. I'm good. Like it is right. So there is a part of like you have to tolerate that vulnerability in order for relationships to even be able to be healing for people to be able to show up for you. And that is hard, but got to let it in. Like, yeah, the acceptance and the figuring out the discomfort with vulnerability is a huge part of moving forward. Yeah. Oh, I love that, Stacey. And thank you for being vulnerable. I think you you just hit the nail on the head because I was thinking back to my own experience and a huge part of why I was seen as such a burden is because of the stories I told myself, right? It, yeah. it was like my anxiety is who I am and it, it's every every part of me is anxiety and that's all people see. But it was also not being vulnerable and not actually letting people support me because I I didn't want people to see it. I didn't want people to have to take it on. But like that is a big part of how you actually heal. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. It, and it's so detrimental to our relationships to not – like even just thinking mm-hmm. of like Rachel and I, like I struggle with a lot of anxiety in different ways than it shows up for Rachel and like running our business together. When I try to pretend like everything is fine and it is clearly not and like <laughs> Rachel's my best friend. Like she knows when I'm not okay but I'm like <laughs> white knuckling it yeah. to try to like – I don't know, save her from something that she doesn't need to be saved from. Like it never, it Mm. typically never ends well. You know what I, like. Correct. Good insight. Good insight. Right. Well, because, and you've told me so many times, you're like, just fucking own it. Like you don't, like, just tell me what's happening and like, we'll be good versus showing up half-assed or in an irritable way or a way that has like shame attached to it. So Mm -hmm. it's like, Mm. We also, if we want those healthy relationships, we have to show up as our full self and trust that Rachel will tell me when it's unhealthy or not working or she needs boundaries, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I remember my husband getting so, we were dating at the time, but he would get so frustrated with me and he would say, 
I can't read your mind. Like, you've got to tell me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help. Like, I'm trying and you're not letting me in. And so I'm just telling you to be calm and to not freak out. (laughs) And isn't that helpful? Doesn't that not make all your anxiety go away when someone's like, just calm down? Right. It was the cure. It was the cure for all my anxiety disorders. (laughs) So (laughs) I, this was another big one and I totally get it. And I am just so interested to, to hear your insights on this. So a lot of people who are struggling with panic agoraphobia are with partners who typically, not always, right, but partners who don't struggle with anxiety disorders. I think it's like this crazy, it was true for my husband and I, like he was, quote, carefree, like adventurous, never had anxiety, would just be like, go do the things and don't worry about it. And I think that's true for a lot of people, that they're paired with people who don't really understand anxiety disorders. And so a a big question that I got asked, right, is how do I make my people understand what it's like? Because I think they think if I can make them understand, it's going to somehow make things easier. (laughs) So let's talk about that. Well, I mean, we could go down the attachment rabbit hole, right, that like most anxiously attached individuals and avoidantly attached individuals like find each other in the universe and then decide to be together if we're talking about monogamous relationships. Uh, That is a thing, and it's quite the (laughs) dominant pairing, a.k.a. Stacey and I, and we just plays out all all over the (laughs) internet. But I feel feel for my anxious peeps because I think what also happens is anxiety is – pretty dysregulating, right? It makes you actually feel a lot of feelings. But I think when you're trying to share that with a partner, you're only communicating the anxiety. And Stace and I talk about this a lot that like, usually when someone's like, I'm anxious, we're like, well, okay, but what else? Like, what, what else are you feeling? They're like, well, no, I'm, I'm anxious. And they're really going into detail about like that anxiety. And if you're not an anxiously attached individual, or you don't struggle with anxiety, that doesn't mean a lot to you. You're kind of looking at your partner, like, okay, calm calm down. They're, you know, very helpful response or like take some deep breaths. And so I say that because anxiety can be almost like this, like, like white noise kind of feeling, but there's usually other things attached to it. Like you're usually really fearful or you're sad or you're hurt. It think of like two chain links together. And so if you're a person that feels like your partner doesn't get it and you want them to number one, anxiety is doing its job. It's making you feel like you're feeling stuff, but you're not. It's just like a, it's like a, almost a little bit of a state that has other things connected to it. And it's a real feeling, but there's so much more like connected to it. I think that's what the partner needs to hear. So what else is kind of influencing your anxiety? Could you name other feelings outside your anxiety? Because anxiety has a tendency to keep us in that state and reinforce it over and over again. And for a partner that doesn't feel those things, they're looking at you with those deer in the headlights, like, uh, that's not helpful. And we'll tend to repeat ourselves over and over again, or kind of go into the minutia of the detail. And you're, and then you're watching your partner not connect with you, which only fuels your anxiety more. Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain more. Let me explain yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> I will yeah. make you get it by yes. repeating the same yeah. detail over and over. Yeah. I mean, to Rachel's point, like I don't, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion or not, but as somebody who has anxiety, I think the idea that our partner needs to fully get and understand it is actually a trap. Like that's yeah. what you're yeah. saying. Like, and and I get the the want to be heard and felt, but I do think what is more important is understanding like how can you then, if your partner doesn't like get anxiety, doesn't get it, how can you still explain to them how you need to be supported? How can you let them know how they can show up for you? And I think that that is the more important thing to like stress and make sure that they are able to do. Um, if you know you struggle with anxiety, then like to fully embody what anxiety is because they don't need to know if they're able to still show up and support you and help in a healthy way. Um, that is more of what the partnership is about in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. No, I'm so glad that you said that, Stacey. I tell my students that I work with and my clients all the time, I think it's less about getting those people around you to understand and your desire is really lying and wanting to be heard and wanting to be validated. And that's so much more helpful because even if you struggled with an anxiety disorder, like I grew up with a mom who did, she 
got it. Like she freaking got it, but she could not like really get my experiences and what I was Mm. going through, you know, as a teenager and into my young adult years, like she kind of understood, but it wasn't like she was living it. So I could tell my mom until I was blue in the face, but I really just wanted her to listen and to be there and to say, I'm, I'm here regard no matter what. And I know it's hard. And so those simple things, I think we overlook them, but they're so, so helpful. Oh yeah, definitely. Trying to remember to, if if feeling seen and heard is so important and if the words they're saying are not resonating with you or you're feeling like, oh, they just don't get it. Okay. So how can they show up for you? Like try and shift. What would you want the positive behavior to look like? Because Mm -hmm. I guarantee that if they said, oh, I really under, I hear you. I understand how you feel. You're going to be like, well, I would like more. I need more, a further confirmation that you understand how I feel. And that's a trap, right? That's going to make your anxiety worse. So trying to remember to go, okay, if I'm feeling like they're not getting it because of the, what they're reflecting back, because I guarantee your partner's not perfect, just like we all aren't. How do I want them to show up for me? What would feel really good if they did in the moment right now that would make me feel seen and heard? What's an actionable thing I can tell them mm. versus I'm going to need these words or I'm going to nitpick on how they reflected it back to me. That's actually going to make your anxiety worse. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. So good. So you both talk about this a lot, right? Navigating conflict. And it's incredibly hard <laughs> to navigate conflict, period, in relationships. But when you're struggling with anxiety, of course, there are so many layers, like we know. And mm-hmm. people will say, you know, when I'm really feeling heightened, when I'm incredibly activated and anxious, I don't know how to navigate any of it. Like it just seems so overwhelming. Do you have any words of wisdom for when somebody's feeling incredibly anxious and they're in the midst of conflict and they're just like, I don't know. I don't even know what to do. Just watch Stacey and I. Just like watch <laughs> one of our work fights and then you could just you could take from what you want from it, right? We should start right? filming those. I don't I don't think we should recommend that. <laughs> it would be incredibly entertaining. Oh my God. This is true. Yeah. So I think you have to listen to that feeling that says, I can't navigate this right now. One of the worst things anybody can do, whether you struggle with anxiety or anger or overwhelm or, you know, depression, whatever it is, if you feel flooded, there's a reason why you do. And you have to listen to that. Nothing good comes. Anybody that that follows Rachel and I, like we are on our self-regulation soapbox every single day. Like (laughs) there is nothing good that comes from being dysregulated and trying to work through a fight. And so I, I do think that part of that work, like even going back to our first question of like, can you be in a relationship when you're working through stuff? It's like, this is one of those relational corrective experiences. How do you take control of your own stuff to be able to regulate, to show up to your relationship conflict in a healthy way. Mm. And if you can't figure that out, like it's not going to translate to any relationship. Like that is just a life skill that we all should have been taught all throughout school. There should be a class in college that we all had to take on it. Like that self-regulation is so incredibly important. So if you're dysregulated, listen to it and then figure out how to take your space, like boundaries, all of it. Self-regulation. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. (laughs) I. Gosh, this was me and I get it when people ask this question. I would, of course, when you're feeling so anxious, you just feel like you're either going to freeze, you're going to lash out, you're going to just get away from it as quickly as you can. And I was like, I did all of the things, but I never stopped to say, it makes sense. Like what you're feeling and how you're feeling makes sense. And like, listen to yourself and give yourself what you need right now. It was just always like, but I've got to figure this out. I've got to, I mean, that's anxiety, right? So. Right. Well, yeah, that's the pull is like with, when you feel anxiety, the actual key to getting through it is figuring out how to tolerate it, but it Mm. feels so intolerable. You want to say and do to make it stop. And so it's so counterintuitive to be like, this is going to pass. It always does. So how do I verbalize that I need space? So I'm speaking from a clear space and I'm not speaking out of this want to feel differently. Um, I mean, that is it's so exhausting, right? Like, I'm like that is that is like how you conquer anxiety, but it's hard. Mm-hmm. Throw oh, in a different so person hard. that you love and triggers you. It's the recipe for for struggle. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And anyone like 
of course, everyone is like, "There's good. Tell me something else, Stacy. There's got to be a better way." <laughs> if really someone else is. can find it, tell I me. Know. <laughs> I know. I'll take the magical thing. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that another thing that's tricky when you're struggling with an anxiety disorder is wanting to be supported by your partner, but many times we find our partners enabling us, if this makes sense. So like when I was struggling with anxiety, my husband would often say, it's okay. You're going to be okay. This isn't that big of a deal. You can, you know, and just always sort of saying, we we don't have to do this. We can find another way. We, we can cancel. It's fine. And I, rather than being helpful, right, he was very enabling of the anxiety. It was just, I'll give you a way out. I will make you not have to face this. I will – and of course, he thought that he was being helpful because he just didn't know and neither really did I. But I also had a little bit of knowing there and I was like, oh, no, this feels better. Like he's going to help me and he's, <laughs> he's going to like say you don't have to do this. So how can your partner actually support you without enabling? Well, I'll speak from the partner's perspective in Stacy and I's relationship because <laughs> that's appropriate and that's what we do all the time anyway. Uh For the partner that has an anxious partner, you have got to learn that you like you still love them even if you can't fix their anxiety. And sometimes that looks like allowing like the discomfort to just be there. So like I'll give you an example. Sometimes when Stace is feeling super duper anxious and kind of comes in and I can tell, right? Like, so if you're in a relationship, you can tell when your partner has already like started maybe feeling anxious, it's why it's really winding up. And so I'm aware, right? Like I'm aware that she is maybe not feeling her best self, but she's pretty anxious and she's talking that with me out loud or her thoughts are kind of in that anxious lens. And so when she says something that she is either maybe, and I don't think it's conscious all the time, wanting me to like solution fix with her or say like, this is totally fine. Um, I've had to learn that sometimes I'm just like, okay, like I, I hear that. Like I don't do the soothing all the time or I'm not like, here's the solutions. I let it be almost incongruent with like my experience. Like, even if it's like, I think we should go paint our building red today. And I'm like, oh, I hear that that's what you'd like to do. Like that didn't happen. (laughs) Um, But you know, like, oh, okay. I don't see it that way. And that's it. Like, I don't try to convince her that like red is a bad color or that we're going to get kicked out of our office building for doing that. You know, like I really just allow it to like sit in the discomfort. And sometimes Stace does not like that very much. Sometimes she's like, okay, you know what? Like I'm going to keep trudging in my own anxiety. And she says that like, look, I just need to be anxious right now about this. And can you kind of like leave me be, but I've had to learn as the partner, like it's okay for us to have that discomfort. Cause it is important for me to show her, like, I don't see it that way. And I don't love you any less for not seeing it that way. And mm. it's important for her to see that like, yeah, I don't, I don't see what you're seeing or feeling, but like, I still love you. And I'm still my own person that is not where you are. So like, that's a long answer in a way of like how to not enable is be authentic about that. That's not your experience, but with like kindness and empathy, but allowing that like incongruence, that rub, that discomfort to happen, I think can just help slow your partner down a little bit without you having to regulate for them or fix it for them or enable it. How does it feel to be on the receiving end of that Stace? (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. And it definitely pisses me off sometimes, but (laughs) When you go the other way, like I know that it, again, like in our in our partnership, um, like it's also been an issue where it causes resentment for Rachel, like yeah, to overfunction true. in certain ways or yeah. to overfunction for my anxiety or, you know, those more enabling things. Like I think that, yeah, for the anxious partner, it's typically not helpful to your point, Shannon. But then for the non-anxious partner, I do think when you are – trying to throw spaghetti at the wall and you're sacrificing yourself, you know, or doing things that you don't really want to do, like it's also not helpful for the dynamic. And so it's a learning curve in trial and error, but yeah, figuring out how to sit with the discomfort on both sides, like stops the, stops the enabling, enabling cycle. And then also you figure out what's, what then is going to actually be helpful because I don't want Rachel to be resentful of me. Like, I don't want her to do things 
that make her feel a certain way, you know, like because she thinks it's what I need, like that doesn't mm-hmm. help my anxiety or make me feel good either. So it's like we all have to figure out what what works and that's part of the work in a dynamic. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I so much goodness here, but I think that resentment, right? It can be so tricky because you convince yourself as the person struggling that the other person, right, is just so overwhelmed, so sick of all your shit, like on their last Mm -hmm. string at all times wanting to leave. And that's not necessarily the reality. But I also look back, right, and I think I'm sure my husband at many times felt frustrated, felt, you know, maybe like it wasn't fair, but it didn't take any of the love that he had for me away, didn't didn't change any of the feelings that he had for me. So it was like he could feel frustrated, he could feel upset, he could feel maybe disappointed or any of the things, but he still loved me and cared about me. But I learned, right, I have to actually help him <laughs> and help. that starts with me helping myself, which is yeah. really freaking hard. <laughs> yeah. It's so hard. So I'm curious if a if somebody is in the spot where they feel like anxiety has really like taken a toll on our relationship, they're feeling like, you know, my partner's clearly burnt out. We're not that like the spark just doesn't, isn't there. Like it feels like we're so disconnected. Feels like the love is gone. Like what do you say to that? I think if somebody showed up in my office saying that, I would probably say that it's not just about the anxiety. If Ooh. if all it is that if if somebody's anxiety is what is like breaking a relationship down, like I don't know. Like if that was yes. all they were like, it is just this, I would say that dynamic has probably uh participated in some yeah. other unhealthy behaviors. I think it I think it's really fair for somebody to feel like a partner isn't a good fit because of their yes. anxiety. Like that that could just not work and like that is such a difficult conversation. Um and it's that's realistic. But I would say if we're like no, we love each other. It's but like it's just like his anxiety. His anxiety is what is like bringing our relationship down. I'd probably be like, well, take a step back and like look at look at what else is going on. Yeah. No. No, I think Stacy is saying something very fair that it's so hard when you put time and effort and you like love somebody, you want it to work so badly. And I think regardless of attachment style, but specifically anxiety, you know, if you're pinning it all on that one thing, I do think there's other things we need to look at. And it's sometimes it's the most painful, but freeing decision you can have to have a conversation of like, this isn't working. And if we're all doing everything we can if your partner is saying like this is all I can do and you feel like you're at your wits end your burnout the spark is gone whatever it is you've got to like accept that um, and work from that place versus hoping they show up for you in a different way that's going to check that box and fill and heal that resentment and also um, prevent it from happening in the future like all of that is not real like that's just not how relationships work and sometimes the hardest conversation can be not how will you change for me, but like, do we have enough in us to change together? Because that's mm-hmm. what gets people through stuff. It's not your person being more perfect or less anxious because then this box will be checked. Like life gets lifey. So if you can work from a place of, are we all doing everything we can? And if the answer is no, like that's that's painful, but that's a better and more empathetic place than this is wrong because of them and because of their anxiety. Like Stay said, I feel like there's like, I'm, that's a little fishy to me. Yeah. No, I agree. It's, it's hard to see it, you know, when you're in it. Totally. <laughs> it's so, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so hard to recognize because looking back, of course, my anxiety played a big role in a lot of the, the relationship issues that my husband and I had, but there was so much more there. <laughs> And actually digging into all that stuff was incredibly helpful. Um, So I just have to say, I I love both of you. Your podcast is so relatable. Like how you approach things, even just in this conversation, like you two are doing exactly what you're meant to be doing. And it's just so cool to see it. And even though Rachel has given you a bit of a hard time, (laughs) Stacey, in this conversation, it's so good to just feel like, your people and you get it and like this is normal and 
just so much acceptance, right, in relationships and in life. And it's such a big component of, you know, healing and just having really healthy, good relationships. And yeah, everything you've shared, I've just, I love it. I want to encourage people to go find you. So Rachel or Stacey, where can people find and connect with you if they want to learn more? (laughs) Our biggest our biggest place where we're showing up most regularly is on Instagram. So that is decoding underscore couples. But like you have mentioned, we also have a podcast that has episodes out every week, more deeper dives on relationship topics. And that's the Decoding Couples podcast. And you can find that on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. So, so good. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a, an amazing conversation. Thanks for having us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Healthy Push. If you want more, head on over to ahealthypush.com for the show notes and lots more tips, tools, and inspiration that will support your recovery. And if you're hoping for me to cover a certain topic, be sure to join my Instagram community at A Healthy Push and let me know in the comments what you want to hear next.